All right, welcome to another anatomy lesson with Dr. H. Um, this is the penultimate <laughs> model of kidney function. Okay, we see that there's a kidney on the right. And what this middle model here is, is this is going to be a single unit of renal cortex and renal pyramid. So if we came on here, it'd be just a little piece of the pie where we cut out this portion and zoom in on it. So this is the renal cortex, and this is the renal capsule on the outside, and this is the renal papilla on the inside. And then the model over here now is where we zoom all the way in on a single renal corpuscle. <clears throat> so that is where we're going to have filtration. So it's a pretty important model to think about. So, so far you guys have probably seen a couple of videos, right? One that talks about the renal cortex and the renal medulla and just allows for urine to drain. Another one hopefully you guys have seen has blood supply where the renal artery feeds the segmental arteries which now feed the interlobar arteries that go out to the cortical radiate arteries which branch to the afferent arterioles. The afferent arterioles head out to here. Right? Each of those afferent arterioles goes to the renal corpuscle. So let's look at that as a zoomed in view. So here now you can see blood supply running up on the side of one of the pyramids. Well this is just an interlobar artery and when it arches over the top of the pyramid this would be the arcuate artery and as it radiates out towards the out towards the cortex, out through the cortex, we have the cortical radiate artery and then each one of those branches to go to one of these renal corpuscles. And you can see the branch there pretty darn well. You can see the branch here really well too. And then we're gonna have filtration. And if we reabsorb material from the tubes out here in the cortex, it's gonna go into the peri, peri meaning surrounding in Latin, peritubular capillaries. And if we reabsorb from down here in the loop, we're going to be dealing with the vasa recta. So that's just a quick recap on the blood supply. I hope that was helpful. But the afferent arterial is going to feed out to this renal corpuscle. And inside of the renal corpuscle is something called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is shown in this model. So this bit of spaghetti on the middle right here, this is a glomerulus. And just to go back to this model here, what you're going to see is just a lot of blood gets filtered in here. And therefore, we're going to end up with filtrate that goes out into this capsule, that goes out into this hard shell. So let's look at this model, and then we're going to come back to the middle again. So this portion of the model shows a single renal corpuscle. And this right here... This is the afferent arterial. We know it's the afferent arterial because the afferent arterial is bigger than the efferent arterial. And the efferent arterial is going to branch to go out and feed the capillary system. Bigger is important physiologically because if the afferent arterial is bigger, what do we know about blood flow in relative to blood flow out? If afferent is bigger, that diameter is bigger, therefore the resistance is less. Therefore, more blood can flow into the glomerulus. And if the diameter of the efferent arterial is small, this is the efferent, it's leaving the glomerulus. If it's smaller, then blood flow out decreases. And what that does is it forces more blood to stay inside of the glomeruli here, inside of the glomerulus, singular. Therefore, increasing the hydrostatic pressure inside of this system. And that forces blood to be filtered into all of this open space here. This is called the Bowman's capsule. This hard shell here is the Bowman's capsule or the renal capsule. I prefer the old school name of Bowman's capsule. And the space in, in between all of this, it would be capsular space. And this is going to fill up with filtrate. And it, as it does, the pressure of the filtrate is going to increase. But there's only one way for the filtrate to leave. 
blood is going to end up exiting through the e efferent, but this isn't blood anymore. This is filtrate. And the Bowman's capsule is completely closed off except for one tube that it can leave from. This tube ends up being extremely twisty and loopy. It ends up being extremely convoluted. This tube is near the renal corpuscle and the glomerulus. So the medical term for near is proximal. So this is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule. The tube that's nearest to the glomerulus and it becomes super twisty windy. We're going to come back to what this structure is up here in just a minute. We're going to come back to how it communicates here in just a minute. But what I want you guys to see now is that on this portion of the model and this portion of the model, you can see that the glomerulus feeds down into a tube that's super twisty. The glomerulus feeds down into a tube that's super twisty that is out in the renal cortex. This here would be the proximal convoluted tubule and the proximal convoluted tubule on this side of the model. So let's follow it. Let's follow it. It's twisty, it's windy, it's proximal, it's proximal, it's proximal. Oh my gosh, it's starting to descend. It's descending. Now we're in the pyramid, right? We've dropped below the arcuate artery. So an anatomist would say we are no longer in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now we are in what's called the nephron loop or the loop of Henle. That's the one that I prefer. And the loop of Henle has a descending portion and an ascending portion. So the most likely scenario is your professor is going to say, what structure is this? Well, this would be the descending limb of the loop of Henle. What structure is this? This is the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. In addition, you'll notice that portions of the loop are thicker and some portions of the loop are thinner. So what if a professor put their pin here? Well, then you need to add whether it's thin or thick. So put the pin here, this would be the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle. Put the pin here, this would be the thin ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Put the pin here, this would be the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. It's a big long names to go with all this cluster, right? But now if you follow this follow this ascending portion, what you'll notice is that it's going to ascend back into the cortex and then it's going to wiggle its way over and come back into contact with the corpuscle from whence it came. Every one of these ascending limbs is going to end up ascending all the way back to the corpuscle from whence it came and that's important. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a second. That's actually really important because that is going to allow for homeostasis. That's going to allow for the glomerulus and the corpuscle to be able to monitor what is left inside of this tubule at this point. Therefore, what do we need to continue to reabsorb and what can we get rid of? At this point, it starts to move away from the glomerulus again. So this is going to be the DCT or the distal convoluted tubule. It's distal. It's far away. It's far away. We've traveled this entire system and now we're far away in the tubule loops, which now feeds back into what's known as the collecting ducts or the collecting tubules, which now goes back into the major collecting duct, the big collecting tube that runs all the way down from the cortex through the pyramid into the renal papilla, and when the filtrate makes it out down here, that's when it becomes urine. So, last thing I want to do is I want to go back to this model. I want to remind you that the ascending limb of the loop of Henle comes back into contact with the glomerulus from whence it came. And what it actually does is what's shown in this model right here. This right here depending on who your professor is. They might call this the DCT. They might call it the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Depends on whether they are an anatomist or a physiologist. A physiologist talks about function. An anatomist would say it's above and in the cortex, therefore it's the DCT. But a physiologist would say this is still having similar function to the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So just keep that in mind, depending on your professor. This, oops, 
This right here, I'm going to go ahead and call um, the DCT at this point. Might as well. Doesn't really matter because we're dealing with anatomy. I'm actually a physiologist, but I want you guys to be able to see how this works. And it's going to come back into contact with the glomerulus from whence it came. But how it actually works is it's going to tie itself <coughs> in between the afferent arterial and the efferent arterial. It goes right in between those two. And here is a group of specialized cells. So this is where we start to get these specialized cells called macula densa cells. Right here, you can see how they start to enlarge and become different than what's on the top of this tube. These are macula densa cells, and they're constantly mon monitoring the, the salt that's in the filtrate. And depending on how much salt is in the filtrate, they're going to try to tell the glomerulus to filter more or filter less. That's for another video. But that's in essence what the macula densa does. And it's going to secrete some cytokines, some local signals that are going to come down and talk to the cells, these specialized cells that live on the outside of the afferent arterial. Okay, these particular cells right here. These are the cells, by the way, that secrete renin. I'm not going to go into too much detail on them, but those are the cells that secrete renin. What do these guys secrete right here? These are renin, and if you know me, if you ever had me as a professor, I push renin so hard. I just had that big long pause because you got to be writing this stuff down. This is where renin is produced from. One of the most important hormones in the human body. It helps regulate blood pressure. It helps to increase blood pressure when blood pressure is low, right? So what better place to monitor your blood pressure than a place that filters 180 liters of blood a day? And as blood pressure drops, the afferent arterial is going to be able to detect that somehow. And it actually detects it because of how much filtration is occurring. Okay, so the macula densa is going to end up communicating to these cells. And these cells are called granular cells, and they secrete the hormone renin. All of this together is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. That's what that whole thing together. Okay, this tube, the macula densa, the granular cells of the afferent arterial, all of that's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And that's going to help us regulate how much filtrate we have. Okay, I sure hope that was helpful. I never intend to ramble. I know sometimes I do. But it's all for good intent. Remember, learning anatomy alone isn't enough. We learn anatomy so we can understand physiology. And that's why I go on my little tangents that I do. I think that about covers most of the anatomy you guys are supposed to know. Some of you may need to know a little bit more. For instance, there are cells that live on the surface of the glomerulus. These are called podocytes. Podocytes are podocytes, right? They are feet cells. They have these big long legs that wrap themselves around the glomerulus down below and they help with the filtering of proteins amongst a number of other functions as well. There's also a serous membrane inside of the Bowman's capsule. There is going to be a serous membrane which tells us that there's two layers. There's going to be a visceral which is on the surface of the glomerulus. The red here depicts glomerulus. So there's a visceral that kind of covers all of this and then there is a parietal layer that is going to be attached to the Bowman's capsule. And that's good because now we have the capacity to hold fluid. And as we filter fluid out, it goes into that cavity and then down into the PCT, proximal convoluted tubules. Please, everybody, write the words out. Don't try to go to a lab practical and write PCT. Your professor is not going to like it. So those... That should cover just about everything you're supposed to cover for your particular class. It covers almost all the anatomy of the kidneys and the functional components of the kidneys as well.
I sure hope this was helpful. That's all I ever want is just to help you guys learn. So, uh, study hard. Best of luck. Be kind to one another. See you in the next video.